So uh, we left off by concluding the fourth juz, and now we are uh, kickstarting on the fifth one. And again, this is Surat al Nisa. We left off on um, ayah number 24. And particularly, this what we covered in the last video, it had a lot of uh, common threads, and it was dealing with uh, inheritances, it was also dealing with uh, divorce proceedings in the first segment of uh, the surah. So if you're just joining me right now, I do welcome you as a non-Muslim to come in on stage and, and have a chat with me about Islam. Um, I am going to conduct the reading first. So uh, I thank you so much in advance for your patience as we get through uh, this section of the reading. And then I'm, I'm going to welcome any form of dialogue um, and help build your questions to the best of my abilities. Uh, naturally, I encourage you to uh, please save this playlist, share it, give it a thumbs up and so on. That way that we can um, show people exactly what it says in the Quran, you know, word for word. And then side by side with me, I have uh, Tafsir Sadi, which is a uh, scholarly commentary on uh, the things that we're going to be reading. So in the event that I have to expunge into greater detail, uh, the best source of information to consult is the scholarly work. So that way that we can get a deeper understanding of things. So uh, with that being said, let's just not delay any more than I already have given my uh, technical difficulties. So let's kick it off. Uh, as always, when you approach the Quran, you want to make ablution, uh, which is called wudu in Arabic, where you're purifying yourself physically. And then the second thing is to uh, make your intentions pure, to seek knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that he can open up your mind and open up your heart. Uh, so make that niya, which is that intention. And then the third thing is before you actually crack the book open, uh, you ask for refuge from the accursed shaitan. So you say, I would be lahim in a shaitan rajim, uh, bismillah rahman rahim, which means that you are, are reciting in the name of uh, God, the most gracious, the most merciful, and you're seeking refuge uh, for him. So <clears throat> you're seeking refuge uh, from Shaitan, from uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So, and also prohibited to you are all married women except those your right hand possesses. This is the decree of Allah upon you, and lawful to you are all others beyond these, provided that you seek them in marriage with gifts from your property, desiring chastity, not unlawful sexual intercourse. So for whatever you enjoy of marriage from them, give them their due compensation as an obligation, and there is no blame upon you for what you mutually agree to beyond the obligation. Indeed, Allah is ever knowing and wise. So uh, nowadays, it's very common to see that um, there's tons of sexually explicit material available uh, online as well as offline. So there's a huge desensitization going on and marriage is extremely frowned upon in most modern uh, secular societies. And this is because there's a fear of commitment, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obviously uh, you cannot have any form, uh, you can't actually even go near any type of um, provocative material or anything like that in Islam. And sexual chastity uh, is something that is uh, a decree upon us until marriage, right? So a decree upon um, mankind until marriage. And the reason being is because uh, when you are committed to somebody in marriage, obviously it's not just an exchange of these gifts, but rather it's a commitment to that person uh, on a far greater level. And what I'm seeing as a common thread in today's times, uh, now it's frowned upon to have uh, marriage and then obviously in certain areas of the world, it's forbidden to have any type of po polygamy, right? But what is encouraged, ironically, is you can have as many girlfriends as you want, and you can go conduct all sorts of uh, immoral acts with strangers. And there's no type of obligation to these people. And naturally, you have the spread of diseases and so on, which is just absolutely terrible for mankind. So I do want to visit the tafsir uh, on this verse uh, 24 because it is a bit of a hot subject. So let's see what Sadi says for us. Uh, so uh, these verses include those who are mahram, prohibited from marriage, through blood ties, through breastfeeding from a foster mother, and through marriage, as well as combinations of relatives to whom marriage at the same time is prohibited. They also describe which women are permissible for marriage. So he's covering uh, verses uh, 23 and 24 in this. Um, now, where 
uh, 24 starts. Let me just get to that uh, particular segment. Uh, okay. Let's see where he begins. Okay. Uh, here we go, I believe. Let me just verify really quickly because he touches up on 23 and we covered that yesterday. So I want to make sure that I'm not doubling down on the 23rd um, verse. Okay. So uh, he, he, he says, also prohibited for marriage are women already married. That is those who have husbands. It is prohibited to marry them so long as they are still married unless they are divorced and have completed the state of uh, or the, um, the state of Idda. Except any slave girl uh, girls you may own, that is those who have been captured in war. So when it's talking about uh, those that your right hand possesses, uh, these are uh, specifically war captives. If a disbelieving woman who is married is captured in war, she becomes permissible for the Muslim after one menstrual cycle has passed, which serves to establish that she is not pregnant. But if a married slave woman is sold or given, her marriage is not invalidated because the second owner is the same person as the previous owner. And, the, and uh, because of the story of uh, Barira, when the Prophet them gave her the choice. Uh, this is Allah's ordinance binding upon you, that is, you must adhere to following its guidelines because in it is healing and light and the uh, explanation of what is permitted and what is prohibited. Okay, um, so a couple things that I can recall just from some additional studies that I've had, even though he doesn't expunge it into great detail as far as the war captives go. So you have to be considerate of the times and when people would go to war, when these tribes would go to war, the women would actually show up there uh, dressed in their best clothing. And that is because they knew that if their husbands didn't come back, that um, they would need to have somebody tend to them. And when they were captives, uh, you there would be an exchange, right? So there is a, a treatment of uh, captives and a treatment of slaves or indentured service in Islam, which is very strict meaning that you have to provide them the same quality of clothes, the same quality of food, uh, the same living conditions. You have to provide them with an education. They also have rights such as property. They have rights of uh, votes and so on. So it's not just like, you know, slavery that you would think of um, in today's time. Now, in ex uh, excuse me, not in today's time, but in the, in the slave trade and what you would think of like the African slave trade. And ironically, um, yes, there is, it is still going on today, unfortunately. Uh, so the idea now is that there needed to be an exchange for the perp for the person that was providing all of these amenities for them because uh, it was as if they were married. It's just that they're not um, they are not under a marriage contract, right? So uh, the exchange is that the woman could provide, you know, uh, children and slavery and being indentured and having children was a way to actually free the offspring. So um, one unique thing that I did find in regards to Islam, uh, there is not a single way on how to transform a free person into a slave, but there are multitudes of ways. And the only things that are discussed in the Quran and the Hadith are how to actually free a slave. So there is no way of taking a free person and making them a slave. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Uh, and now, um, in regards to um, uh, the obligations and the duties of that uh, woman, uh, naturally, she would have to provide something to that man who is providing everything else for her. Okay, so bringing it back full circle. Uh, Sadi says, that is those who have been captured in war. Okay, so uh, let's see. We left off of him saying, this is Allah's ordinance binding upon you that is, you must adhere to following its guidance because in it is healing and light and the explanation of what is permitted and what is prohibited. All women other than these are lawful for you. This refers to all those who are not mentioned in this verse. They are permissible and good. Thus, what is prohibited is limited, but there is no limit to or restriction on that which is permitted. This is the kindness and the mercy of Allah and is intended to make things easy for people. 
so that you may seek them with your wealth. That is, that you may seek those whom you have seen and chosen from among those whom Allah has permitted to you, provided that your aim is honest wedlock. That is, provided that you are seeking chastity, avoiding fornication, and seeking to help your women remain chaste as well. Not fornication. The one who commits fornication is not keeping his wife chaste because he is fulfilling his desires in a prohibited manner. So his desire for permissible sex is weakened, and thus he is failing to keep his wife chaste. This indicates that one who should marry a person who is not chaste because Allah says, a man who fornicates may only marry a woman who fornicates or who is a polytheist, and a man who fornicate uh, and a woman who fornicates may only marry a man who fornicates or who is a polytheist. Such marriages are forbidden to believers, and this is Surah An-Nur, uh, verse twenty-four, three. So, coming back to uh, the Quran, and whoever among you cannot find the means to marry free believing women, then he may marry from those whom your right hand possesses of believing slave girls. So the believing slave girls come first. And Allah is uh, most knowing about your faith. You believers uh, are of one another. So marry them with the permission of their people and give them their due compensation, which is mah, according to what is acceptable. So remember, there's still a, a permission that's, that's granted. They should be chased, neither of those whom commit unlawful intercourse randomly, nor those who take secret lovers. But once they are sheltered in marriage, if they should commit adultery, then for them is half the punishment for free unmarried women. This allowance is for him among you who fears affliction, which is sin, but to be patient is better for you, and Allah is forgiving and merciful. Allah wants to make clear to you, to you the lawful from the unlawful and guide you to the good practices of those before you and to accept your repentance, and Allah is knowing and wise. So again, there's conditions. There's conditions, there are restrictions on how you treat uh, these indentured servants, uh, how you elect to marry them, what are your intentions. You're going to be held accountable to all of these things, okay? Uh, so if, you're, if you have some type of private agenda or something like that, um, it's just not, it's not going to fly. Allah wants to accept your repentance, but those who follow their passion... Uh, who follow their passions want you to digress into a great deviation, okay? And Allah wants to lighten for you your difficulties, and mankind was created weak. Um, o oh, you who have believed, do not consume one another's wealth unjustly, but only in lawful business by mutual consent, and do not kill yourselves or one another. Indeed, Allah is to you ever merciful." So here we have strict warnings, both on wealth consumption and, and um, how we engage with one another to, you know, uh, to not cause uh, harm and also to uh, prevent any unnecessary death. And whoever does that in aggression and injustice, then we will drive him into a fire. And that for Allah is always easy. So remember, when you have something as severe uh, as, you know, killing then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reinforces it with a stern warning saying that whoever commits these types of injustices or acts of aggression, then um, for him is the fire and that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is easy. If you avoid the major sins which you are forbidden, we will remove from you your lesser sins and admit you to a noble entrance into paradise. And do not wish for that by which Allah has made some of you exceed others. For men is a share of what they have earned, and for women is a share of what they have earned. And ask Allah of his bounty. Indeed, Allah is ever of all things knowing. So here's the thing. There's always a, um, a, uh, a push for like the equality between men and women. And the reality is uh, we are made different. We think differently. Uh, we are not equal on very many levels. The, uh, in, with respect to the piety and uh, our status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is a, is a manner that we will be judged with equally. However, a woman has duties that's different than a man and likewise vice versa. So a man has to uphold his duties and remain pious and conduct all of the restrictions that are put on him and all the conditions that are put on him. And likewise, same too for the woman. Uh, and, for all, uh, and for all, we have made heirs to what is left by parents and relatives. 
And to those whom your oaths have bound to you, give them their share. Indeed, Allah is ever over all things a witness. So if you've got an oath or a promise to somebody, uh, you better keep it. Men are in charge of women by right of what Allah has given one over the other and what they spend for maintenance from their wealth. And uh, I'm definitely going to check up the tafsir on this one. And the reason being is because it's yet again another hot um, hot subject. So hopefully we can have um, some additional details by Asadi. Uh, to my understanding and my own personal reflection, when it comes to uh, being um, in charge of a woman, you're basically a guardian. So you have obligations to provide for them. You have obligations to protect them. You have obligations to... Um, similarly to how there needs to be a, a leader in the house, uh, this is the responsibility of a man. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't sit with your wife and have a conversation with her and respect her feelings and respect her wishes because women are elevated in Islam to an extremely high status. I mean, uh, the very chapter that we're reading is titled The Women. Okay, there's no such thing as the man uh, or, or the men in the Quran. So women are very, very honored. They're very cherished, very respected, and they're preserved, um, similar to how a gift would be, right? And that's part of the uh, main reasons why uh, the hijab is so important is because if you had something that you wanted to preserve, you would want to protect it and conceal it. You know, you don't just go around just flaunting diamonds and jewelry and everything like that. Um, it's just not the way, right? So when it comes to this, uh, I'm going to finish the verse and I'm going to see what Asadi says. So righteous women are devoutly obedient, guarding in the husband's absence what Allah would have them guard. But those wives from whom you fear arrogance, first advise them, then if they persist, forsake them in bed, and finally strike them lightly. But if they obey you once more, uh, seek no means against them. Indeed, uh, Allah is ever exalted and grand. And obviously, this is one of the... Um, most common verses that a lot of apologists use against Islam in regards to striking, and they claim that you can beat your wife. Uh, this is extremely forbidden in Islam. Uh, you cannot beat your wife by any means whatsoever. As a matter of fact, um, the, the process and the word, the Arabic word here that's used is similar to how we make tayammum. So when there's no water available and you make wudu, uh, the word that is used to strike the ground is basically you're, you're conducting a, a tap like this. So the Prophet gave us an example of what this meant. And it was basically just to grab somebody by the shoulder and to shake them, to wake them up because you're losing the person. Meaning like you need to come back to reality. We have now come to a point where uh, it's getting to, to such a serious point. that I have to grab you by the shoulder. And obviously he is the best example for mankind. There has not been a single report of him ever striking any of his wives, beating them, inflicting pain, uh, causing any type of mark to be left behind. These are all forbidden in a state of Islam. So similar to how we would make uh, tayammum, which is uh, to uh, purify our body when, when we have no access to water, you wouldn't be sitting there and punching your fists into the ground till they're bloody uh, in order to make tayammum. It, that would just be silly. You're just tapping it lightly like this so that the sand gets on your hands and you're you're spreading it accordingly with your body. You're not going to inflict pain on yourself. So it's it's in the exact same manner uh, that is uh, described there. Now, if you look, there is a process here. And if you were to research modern day psychology, especially when it comes to marriage counseling, um, this is exactly the process that they take. Right. It's exactly the process that they take. First, you advise them. Then if they persist, forsake them, which is meaning you're taking space uh, from the bed. And finally, you're basically going to just going to level with them. You're going to grab them by the shoulder and you're going to say, you know what, if this doesn't change, I'm out. Right. So let's see what uh, Asadi says. So here Allah tells us that men are in charge of women. That is, they are in charge with regard, with regard to making sure that they are doing their duties towards Allah by keeping up with the obligatory duties and restraining them from committing evil. Men are obliged to make sure that they, their women, adhere to that. They are also in charge of them in terms of spending on them, clothing them, and providing accommodation to them. Then he states, the reason why men are in charge of women is because Allah has made one of them excel the other and because they spend of their wealth on them. That is because of the superiority of men over women. Men are superior to women in many ways. For examples, 
positions of political authority are only for men, as is prophethood and messengerhood. Moreover, men are singled out uh, to the exclusion of women for many acts of worship, such as jihad, which in this case, obviously, it's talking about the military jihad, but there's other forms of jihad, such as jihad to nefs, which is taking care of your own self uh, and purifying your own spirit, fighting up against your own uh, nefs so that it's not conducting bad deeds. So obviously, this is talking about the jihad when it comes to fighting and Eid and Jum'ah prayers. So these are all obligations on men and women do not have these types of obligations. It is also because of what Allah has bestowed exclusively on them of wisdom, mature thinking, patience, and perseverance, the like of which women do not have. And I can see why this is relevant, especially uh, because of the emotional fluxes that women have, uh, particularly in regards to hormonal changes when it comes to their uh, monthly cycles, as well as what their responsibilities are in regards to maintaining the household, um, protecting, cultivating children, educating children, and so on. Uh, if you happen to have a kid, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But it's very easy to lose your mind. So uh, the idea is now that you are being protected and preserved from being involved with other critical things. Rather, you have a specific dedication that's uh, sent over to you. Men also have the exclusion, uh, or excuse me, the exclusive obligation of spending on their wives. Moreover, there are many types of spending that are demanded exclusively, uh, exclusively of men by which they are distinct from women. Perhaps this is the reason why Allah says, and because they spend of their wealth on them. No mention is made of those on whom they are to spend as to, uh, so as to indicate spending in a general sense. Thus, it is known that a man is like a guardian and a master to his wife, and she is like a, a servant to him. Therefore, his role is to do his duty towards which Allah has put him in charge of. The woman's role is to obey her Lord and obey her husband. Hence, Allah says, therefore, the righteous women are obedient to Allah and guard in their husband's absence what Allah would have uh, would have them guard. That is, they obey their husband even in their absence. The wife guards her husband with regards to herself and his wealth as because Allah has enjoined upon them to guard themselves and he has guided them to that. Uh, they could not do it without his help because the human soul is inclined towards evil. But whoever puts his trust in Allah, he will suffice him and take care of everything uh, that worries him of his religious and worldly affairs. So remember, our, our point of reference is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the commandments that he put down. Meaning that when a woman is obeying his husband, or, or excuse me, when a woman is obeying her husband, uh, that husband, if he's following the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in doing so, the woman is actually obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what that tells me on my personal reflection is, is that if you have a, a, a husband who is following Islam in the manner that it is intended to be followed, never will he put her in a position of harm, never will he put her in a position where, uh, you know, she is uh, feeling some type of like envy or jealousy or something to that extent, you know, with him doing shady things. Um, and there's going to be genuine happiness in the family because everybody is adhering to God's law. So anything that's in contradiction to that, you're going to have issues. And uh, kind of what that makes me reflect upon is when you hear stories of um, people that are claiming to be Muslim, but they're mistreating their wives. I'm not here to question their Islam, but it's very clear cut in uh, how we should be treating our women and what we should be protecting them from. Now, if you are your, your wife's uh, first bully, then you are conducting a, a, a sin and an un-Islam, you are not treating your wife in the manner that Islam has commanded you to treat your wife. So if you were to elevate your wife, respect your wife and follow the teachings of Islam, your wife's not going to have any problem listening to you. Very simple. As for those women on whose part you fear defiant disobedience, that is their refusal to obey their husband, such as disobeying them in word and deed, in that case, a husband may discipline his wife, starting with the mildest of measures. First, admonish them, that is explaining the rule of Allah with regard to obedience and disobedience to the husband. Encourage them to be obedient and warn them against disobedience. If the wife stops, uh, that is the desired result. Otherwise, the husband should refuse to share her bed and not sleep with her or have intimate relations with her to the extent that will achieve the desired aim. 
If that does not succeed, uh, he may uh, he may strike her in a manner that does not cause pain. If one of these means is successful and the, and they, the wives, obey the husbands, take no further action against them. That is, you have got what you wanted, so stop rebuking her for what happened in the past and stop looking for faults because that will cause harm and stir up dispute. Verily, Allah is, is most high and great. That is, he is absolutely exalted in all aspects, in his essence, in status, and in might. He is the great, and nothing is greater than him, or more majestic, or more mighty. He, uh, his great, he is great in his essence and attributes. So once again, um, the same thing, the scholarly position is that you are not allowed to cause pain. So if uh, you hear of anybody saying that you can... Uh, conduct these types of acts where you're quote unquote beating somebody. No, it's the furthest from the truth. Okay. Carrying on. And if you fear dissension between the two, send an arbitrator from his people and an arbitrator from her people. If they both desire reconciliation, Allah will cause it between them. Indeed, Allah is ever knowing and aware. So here you have it. Um, if you guys aren't able to solve your own problems, then there needs to be some sort of arbitration. And, you know, this can be anything from, obviously, consult a scholar on this. It's not a scholarly opinion, but there's things like marriage counseling. There's things like independent therapy and all this other stuff. Uh, worship Allah and associate nothing with him and to uh, parents do good and to relatives, orphans, the needy, the near neighbor, the neighbor farther away, the companion at your side, the traveler, those whom your right hand hands possess. Indeed, Allah does not like those who are self-deluded and boastful. So subhanAllah, here you have an, an encompassing of what type of conditions you need to be treating people. Um, and you have all of the, the, the key people basically within your immediate sphere of influence, beginning with uh, parents, okay? Uh, well, first off, it, it begins with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So naturally, you should be in a state of worship. And then you should be um, obedient to your parents, do good, treat them well, and to relatives, orphans, the needy, the near neighbor, the neighbor further away, the companion at your side, okay, uh, the traveler, and those whom your right hands possess. So meaning even, even in the indentured servitudes, they must be treated with kindness. So you can't be going around striking you know, people randomly or all this stuff that you hear on the streets. The Quran is very clear on that. Um, and obviously he is, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has um, given you plenty of warnings along with the conclusion of just this one particular verse saying, Allah does not like those who are self-deluding and boastful. So if you're out there and you're trying to, you know, make up your own rules and do your own thing, it's it's not a good, not a good look for you. Who are, uh, are so those people that are self-deluded and uh, self-deluding and boastful, who are stingy and enjoin upon others people's stinginess and conceal what Allah has given them of his bounty. And we have prepared for the disbelievers a humiliating punishment. So again, if you're somebody who disbelieves in these rules, disbelieves in treating people kindly, including your spouse and strangers and those who your right hand possesses, there's a humiliating punishment waiting for you. And also those who spend of their wealth uh, to be seen by the people and believe not in Allah nor in the last day. And he to whom Satan is a companion, then evil is he as a companion. So, you know, there's often a, a conversation between um, guys and people that are just saying, you know, I'm a really good person and I do all these good things and I give to charity and all this other stuff. All of that stuff is useless is if you're not doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you're not doing it for the sake of God, you will get the worldly reward, right? Which is the recognition of being a charitable person. You might get your name on a plaque or something to that extent. But in regards to uh, the award in the afterlife or the hereafter, why should Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give it to you? Why? If you don't believe in him anyway, why should he give it to you? Um, and what harm would come upon them if they believed in Allah in the last day and spent out of what Allah provided for them? And obviously, this is a wonderful question to ask them. You know, what, what's the harm? What's the harm in believing in God, right? And holding yourself to these higher standards and holding yourself to this higher criteria. And Allah is ever about them knowing. Indeed, Allah does not do injustice even as much as an Adam's way. While if there is a, a good deed, 
he multiplies it and gives from himself a great reward. And we touched upon this subject um, a little bit uh, on how the game is rigged in your favor. So how will it be when we bring from every nation a witness and we bring you, O Muhammad, وسلم, against these people as a witness? That day, so the prophets are going to uh, be a witness against uh, against their people. Uh, and likewise, same thing with the disbelievers, right? Um, so that day, those who disbelieved and disobeyed, the messenger will wish they could be co covered by the earth, and they will not conceal from Allah a single statement. O oh, you who have believed, so talking to the people that have believed, do not approach prayer while you are intoxicated until you know what you are saying, or in a state of janabah, except those passing through a place of prayer until you have washed your whole body. And if you are ill or on a journey or one of you come from the place of relieving your, himself or you have contacted a woman, uh, contacted women, i.e. had sexual intercourse and find no water, then seek clean earth and wipe over your face and your hands with it. Indeed, Allah is ever pardoning and forgiving. And this is the concept of tayammum, which I touched up about um, just previously. So obviously you have to be in a state of purity. And uh, this is one of the first uh, verses that was revealed in regards to um, intoxication. So naturally it gets abrogated. So first, because the uh, pagan people at the time, they used to be uh, really big on their you know, alcohol, right? Uh, and, and other forms of intoxicants. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came down with the degree saying that uh, if you are intoxicated, you are not permitted to pray, right? So now you have the first step. And this is one of the beauties of the Quran uh, and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he didn't make these people quit cold turkey because it would have been life-threatening, right? Especially if you have a serious addiction to these intoxicants. Um, people know addictions to nicotine, they know addictions to alcohol and all this other stuff. You can see how the mercy of Islam is where it's a step-by-step -step thing. And remember, this scripture came revealed uh, over the course of 23 years. Have you not seen those who were given a portion of the scripture purchasing error in exchange for it and, and wishing you would lose the way? So again, it's touching back up on uh, the people who have traded uh, traded the hereafter for um, a, a worldly gain. And Allah is most knowing of your enemies and sufficient is Allah as an ally and sufficient is Allah as a helper. Among the Jews are those who distort words from their proper places, which is their usages, and say, we hear and obey and hear, uh, but be not heard, uh, and ra inna, twisting their tongues and defaming the religion. And if they had said, instead, we hear and obey uh, and wait for us to understand, it would have been better for them and more suitable, but Allah has cursed them for their disbelief. So they believe not except for a few. So there is still a few believing people uh, that is left, but because their scriptures were changed, and again, this is another um, claim that's, that, that seems to be a common thread, especially with the, uh, with the chapters uh, two and three that we covered, there's been multiple claims now that, that there is uh, shifts to the previous scriptures, and particularly the Jewish scriptures, but also the Christian ones as well. O you who were given the scripture, believe in what we have sent down to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, confirming that which is with you before we obliterate faces and turn them towards their backs or curse them, as we curse the Sabbath breakers. And ever is Allah, uh, and ever is the matter or decree of Allah accomplished, meaning that um, there was a stern warning that's being given to them, and because of that stern warning, uh, you need to uh, face face reality, face truth, and accept the messenger. Otherwise, there's going to be a severe consequence. And he gives us an example of what the previous one was. Indeed. Allah does not forgive association with him, but he forgives what is less than that for whom he wills. And he who associates other with Allah has certainly fabricated a tremendous sin. So obviously in Islam, we believe that the biggest sin is shirk, which is um, partnership. Uh, it comes from the root word sharaka, which is partnership. So if you uh, are associating any type of idolatry, if you're associating any type of 
uh, worship of your own desires. You've got some funky universalism or you, you believe in like the elements are God or something like that. Uh, Hinduism is a prime example of uh, association of partnership. Christianity, the elevation of Jesus, uh, to a divine status. Um, this is this is all very, very, very wrong. Have you not seen those who claim themselves to be pure? Rather, Allah purifies whom he wills, and injustice is not done to them, even as much as a thread in, inside a date seed. Look how they invent about Allah untruth, and sufficient is, is that as a manifest sin. Have you not seen those who were given a portion of the scripture who believe in jibt, uh, superstition and tarut, which is false objects of worship, and say about disbelievers, these are uh, these are better guided than the believers as to the way. So this was the argument. The argument was that um, they believed in their false gods and that they were uh, these uh, false deities were uh, providing better guidance than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Okay, continuing on. Those are the ones whom Allah has cursed, and he whom Allah curses never will you find for him a helper. Or have they, or have they a share of dominion? Meaning, obviously, uh, this is a rhetorical question. Uh, obviously, they do not have a share of the dominion. And this is talking about the idols that are being worshipped. Then, if that were so, they would not give the people even as much as the speck on a date seed. So, or, or, or do they envy people for what Allah has given them of his bounty? But we had already given the family of Abraham the scripture and wisdom and conferred upon them a great kingdom. And some among them believed in it, and some among them were averse to it, and sufficient is hell as a blaze. Indeed, those who disbelieve in our verses, we will drive them into a fire. Every time their skins are roasted through, we will replace them with other skins so that uh, they may taste the punishment. Indeed, Allah is ever exalted in might and wise. Now, obviously, this is in reference. Um, remember, it's again the, the reward and the punishment system. And I know that the punishment seems severe, but that's because he was talking about association of partnership. And remember, from an Islamic standpoint, from an Islamic standpoint, that's the worst sin that you can commit. So with that um, Islamic position, you're obviously going to have an example of one of, of just how severe the punishment is. Uh, so uh, please, you know, if you if you would just reflect on yourselves and reflect on this, uh, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will come to recognize that the creator does exist. And we, um, you know, I encourage you to take a, a copy of the Quran. I'm happy to send you one so that you can read this yourself and personally reflect on it in your alone time. Uh, indeed, uh, let's carry on. But those who believe and do righteous deeds, we will admit them to gardens beneath which rivers flow, wherein they abide forever. For them therein are purified spouses, and we will admit them uh, to deepen, a deepening shade. So here is on the contrary. On the contrary, if you do believe in me, I'm going to give you some of the best rewards possible and even more things that you can't even think of. OK, and how simple of a thing is it to just believe in God? Uh, now it's about figuring out who your creator is and recognizing that, it, that Islam is the way to him. Indeed, Allah commands you to render trust to whom they are due. And when you judge between people to judge with justice, excellence is that which Allah instructs you. Indeed, Allah is ever hearing and seeing. Now, this would be a beautifully applicable thing to our court systems. Rather, uh, right now, what we have is basically justice being green. So you can buy yourself out of uh, or ransom yourself out of some type of trouble that you're in. But remember the example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the, the example of disbelievers coming on the day of judgment and offering the world's weight in gold for ransom. But you're not going to be able to ransom yourself out. Okay. O you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those in authority among you. And if you disagree over anything, refer it to Allah and the messenger if you should believe in Allah in the last day. That is the best way and the best in result. So obviously, if you have a disagreement about something, Quran and Sunnah. Just Quran and Sunnah. It's simple as that. If you do believe in God and you believe in the guidance that he sent down, you're going to believe that he's going to provide you the best possible uh, result and the best possible question, um, uh, best possible answers to your questions. 
Have you not seen those who claim to have believed in what was revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and what was revealed before you? They wish to refer legislation to Tabut, while they were commanded to reject it, and Satan wishes to lead them far astray. So this is talking about the people that are associating partnerships with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and when it is said to them, come to what Allah has revealed and to the messenger, you see the hypocrites turning away from you in aversion. So how will it be when disaster strikes them because of what their hands have put forth? And then they come to you swearing by Allah, we intended nothing but good conduct and accommodation, which is a lie, right? He's talking about hypocrites. Those are the ones of whom Allah knows what is in their heart. So turn away from them, but admonish them and speak to them a far-reaching, effective word. Meaning, give them the truth. Uh, the truth is far-reaching, and the truth is more effective, period. You, you can't argue with truth. If it's the truth, it's the truth. And we do not send any messenger except to be obeyed by permission of Allah. And if when they worship themselves... They had come to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and asked forgiveness of Allah, and the messenger had asked forgiveness for them. They would have found Allah accepting of repentance and merciful. So there you have it. If you were just to turn face and and swallow your ego and swallow your pride, and ask for forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa taala is guaranteeing it. But no, by your Lord, they will not truly believe until they make you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, judge concerning that over which they dispute amongst themselves, and then find within themselves no discomfort from what you have judged and submit in full willing submission. Carrying on. And if we had decreed upon them, kill yourselves or leave your homes, they would not have done it, except for a few of them. But if they had done what they were instructed, it would have been better for them and a firmer position for them in faith. So this is talking about a specific group of disbelievers. And then uh, we would have given them from us a great reward and we would have guided them to a straight path. And whoever obeys Allah and the messenger, those will be the ones upon whom Allah has bestowed favor of the prophets. The steadfast affirms, uh, affirmers of truth, the martyrs and the righteous, and excellent are those as companions. That is the bounty from Allah, and sufficient is Allah as a knower. O you who have believed, take your precaution and either go forth in, in companies or go forth altogether. And indeed, there is among you he who lingers behind, and if disaster strikes you, he says, Allah has favored me in that I was not present with them. But if bounty comes to you from Allah, he will surely say as if, for example, showing that there had never been between you and him any affection. Oh, I wish I had been with them so I could have attained a great attainment. So this is obviously talking about concepts of jealousy, especially for the people that were courageous. And um, they took uh, a very courageous task upon themselves and the ones that uh, had stayed behind and avoided some type of a trial, they are praising their choice. But then if there was a reward at the end of that, that trial, uh, they would uh, take that enmity and that animosity towards you personally. Uh, and let's not, let's not lie, I'm pretty sure that most of us have run into those types of people in the world. So let those fight in the cause of Allah who sell the life of this world for the hereafter. And he who fights in the cause of Allah and is killed or achieves victory, we will bestow upon him a great reward. And this is talking about uh, a form of jihad. Now, again, this doesn't mean that it's a form of military jihad, right? We would have to take a look at the, a deeper interpretation of the context. But um, taking care of your parents is a form of jihad. Taking care of your siblings, taking care of your neighbors, taking care of yourself, taking care of your spouse, children. This is all form of jihad, Okay. And remember, as a definition, jihad is to strive and struggle in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is the matter with you that you fight not in the cause of Allah for the oppressed among men, women, and children who say, Our Lord, take us out of this city of oppressive people and appoint for us from yourself a protector and appoint for us from yourself a helper. Those who, uh, those who believe fight in the cause of Allah and those who disbelieve fight in the cause of tarut, which is that partnership, or idolatry. So fight against the allies of Satan. Indeed, the plot of Satan has ever been weak. 
And truth be told, guys, his tactic, Satan, uh, Shaitan, Iblis, his tactic has never changed. It's just, he's just persistent. That's it. I mean, it, it's just a, a, a repackaging and a re-representation of what was from the beginning, right? Um, even with, uh, with Adam, السلام, when he told him, oh, yeah, you definitely want to go near that tree. You know, there's something in it for you. And he diverted Adam Alayhi attention towards the tree. So his attention went from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the tree. And now Adam probably started thinking after who knows how many millions of years, by the way. It's not like he just told him once and boom, you know, he went over to it. But rather, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the exact same thing over and over and over and over and over again. You had gladiators in the Colosseum. You have celebrities in stardom today. You have wealth and riches way back when. You have wealth and riches today. It's, it's the exact same thing, right? Um, have you not seen those who were told, restrain your hands from fighting and establish prayer and give zakat, which is chariot? But then when a battle was ordained from, uh, for them, at once a party of them feared men as they fear Allah, or with even greater fear. They said, our Lord, why have you decreed upon us fighting? If only you had postponed it for us for a short time. Say the enjoyment of this world is little, and the hereafter is better for he who fears Allah. An injustice will not be done to you, even as much as a thread inside of a date seed. So here's the deal. If there's times where you have to stand up for injustice, and this involves fighting, you know, whether that be breaking up a fight and taking a punch in the head from like a schoolyard bully, uh, all the way to the atrocities that we're seeing in today's time with Gaza, Palestine, and all the other uh, places that are being oppressed, you stand up and you fight. But the idea is that you do it knowing that you're fighting fisa bilillah and that you're standing up for justice. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that you should go do something stupid and, uh, you know, a'udhu billah, you know, take a, a, a um, a form of vigilantism in your hands because vigilantism is, is forbidden in Islam. You can't go and now do a bunch of stupid things. There has to be a due process. You can still fight the good fight by going, talking to your politicians, dealing with things in a peaceful, peaceful and diplomatic manner. And the ones that are supposed to go out and conduct stuff from like a military standpoint, then that's going to be decided by uh the people that are in charge okay but those people that are in charge uh they need convincing to stand on the path of justice period okay so uh wherever you may be death will overtake you even if you should be within uh, towers of lofty construction but if good comes to them they say this is from allah and if evil befalls them they say this is from you say all things are from allah so what is the matter with those people that they can hardly understand any statement? What comes to you of good is from Allah, but what comes to you of evil, O man, is from yourself. And we have sent you, O Muhammad وسلم, to the people as a messenger and sufficient is Allah as a witness. So here again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that it's your own hands that are causing these issues. And uh, he has no, you know, he, he is... He, you know, th this whole argument of like, oh, God is evil because he created evil. No, he created the environment for evil to, to manifest and, and to fester. But it's us as human beings that are conducting all these atrocities that uh, are promoting evil and ultimately um, perpetrating it. Okay. He who obeys the messenger has obeyed a lot. But those who turn away, we have not sent you over them as a guardian. And again, this is another uh, fantastic uh, a fantastic reference to anybody who may potentially be a hadith rejecter. So if you're disobeying the messenger, you're ipso facto disobeying Allah and ipso facto disobeying the Quran. And they say, we pledge obedience, but when they leave you, a group of them spend the night determining to do other than what you say. But Allah records what they plan by night. So leave them alone and rely upon Allah and sufficient is Allah as a disposer of affairs. Uh, then do they not reflect upon the Quran? If it had been from any other than Allah, they would have found within it much contradiction. So this is a challenge to all the people that are um, uh, in a state of disbelief 
and in opposition to Islam, they say that the Quran has a bunch of contradictions. Uh, we're still waiting for those things to come up, and we've been waiting for 1400 years, and alhamdulillah, we'll, we'll be waiting until the day of judgment, and then uh, they'll be shown the truth. And when there comes to them something, which is information about public security or fear, they spread it around. But if they had referred it back to the messenger or to those of authority among them, then the ones who can draw correct conclusions from it would have known about it. And if not for the favor of Allah upon you and his mercy, you would have followed Satan except for a few. So again, uh, there is a due process, especially when it comes to something like the Quran. You first start with the messenger, then you go to the people of knowledge. You know, there's a due process. So you can't just come up, make these, you know, wild accusations and then be like, oh, I found this and I read this somewhere, have no understanding of Arabic, have no understanding of the context, have no understand, understanding of the depth and the breadth of the information on how the language was used, what was referenced, you know, this, that, and the third. I mean, people back in the old days, they used to think that a fever was a form of magic, okay? So like if you're sitting there and someone's just got like a, they're, they're running a fever, they're, they think that they're struck by a spell. And they used to talk like that, right? So then if you'd think that at first glance, you're looking at something like this and you're just like, oh, there's a magician and all this other stuff. Yeah, because they didn't know what to word it as, right? They were superstitious people, period. Uh, so yeah, you have to understand a lot before you can unpack uh, the Quran. So fight, O Muhammad, in uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, in the cause of Allah, you are not held responsible except for yourself. And encourage the believers to join you that perhaps Allah will restrain the military might of those who disbelieve. And Allah is greater in might and stronger in exemplary punishment. Whoever intercedes for a good cause will have a share, which is a reward therefrom. And whoever intercedes for an evil cause will have a portion, which is a burden therefrom. And ever is Allah over all things a keeper. And here's what I love about the Quran. Every single time it talks about good and justice, it always talks about reward. And every single time it talks about conducting an act of evil, it always talks about punishment or a burden. I mean, I don't understand how anybody can take a look at this book and say that it is bad or the writer uh, slash author, excuse me, the author is evil in any way. Period. I mean, you just look like a fool. Okay. And when you are greeted with a greeting, greet in return with one that is uh, with one better than it, or at least return it in a like manner. Indeed, Allah is ever over all things an accountant. I mean, you know, look, even after I just said that, and subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just reinforces it with such a simple thing as a greeting. You know, it's broken down to the absolute basic things. And alhamdulillah for that. Alhamdulillah for Islam. Okay, Allah, there is no deity except him. He will surely assemble you for account on the day of resurrection, about which there is no doubt. And who is more truthful than Allah in statement? Meaning, why would, why would God want to lie in any way? What is the matter with you that you are two groups concerning the hypocrites? Uh, while Allah has made them fall back into error and disbelief for what they earned, do you wish to guide those whom Allah has sent astray? And he whom Allah sends astray, never will you find for him a way of guidance. Meaning, again, we're reinforced with the concept that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the one that guides. Uh, it's not us. So if Allah chooses to take a group of people astray, in his infinite wisdom, he has chosen to do that. Uh, they wish you would disbelieve as they disbelieve, so you would be alike. So do not take from among them allies until they emigrate from the cause of Allah. But if they turn away, which is to refuse, then seize them and kill them for their betrayal and wherever you find them and take not from among them any ally or helper. Now, obviously, this is talking in, in regards to a specific context. Uh, so if it was a time of war or a time of persecution, there is going to be spies. There is going to be people that you cannot trust. Right. So uh, what we can do is let me see if I can locate in the tafsir. Uh, maybe it might give us a little bit of um, context as to what's happening here. So bear with me really quickly while I locate it. <clears throat> um, we have 87, 88, and we're on 89. 
Okay, wonderful. What is meant by the hypocrites mentioned in this ver in these verses is the hypocrites who appeared outwardly to be Muslims but did not migrate in addition to being disbelievers. So it's it's talking specifically in that time frame, okay, for the people that uh, did not migrate in addition to being disbelievers. Some confusion about their situation had arisen amongst the companions. Some of them, uh, excuse me, radiallahu anhumah. Some of them felt uneasy about fighting them and severing ties with them because of what they showed of apparent faith, whilst others were aware of their true nature on the basis of their deeds. Thus, they deemed them disbelievers. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them that they should not be confused about them or have any doubts. Rather, the situation was quite, quite clear and there was nothing confusing about it. They were hypocrites who had repeatedly shown their disbelief and in addition to their disbelief, they wish that you would disbelieve and become like them. Once you understand that this is how, how they are, therefore do not take any of them as allies or friends. This requires that you should not love them because alliances and friendships can only stem from love. It also requires that you should hate them and regard them as enemies because the prohibition on anything is commanded to do the opposite. The command was something temporary until they migrated. If they migrated, they were to be treated like all other Muslims as the Prophet وسلم, applied the rulings of Islam to everyone who had been with him and migrated with him, whether they were truly believers or one or only making an outward show of faith. So again, there's that mercy. But if they did not migrate and they refused to do so, seize them and slay them where you, wherever you find them. That is at any time in any place. This is part of the evidence which indicates that the prohibition on fighting during the sacred months had been abrogated, as it is the view of the majority of scholars. Those who disagree say that these are general texts and are to be interpreted as being subject to the prohibition on fighting during the sacred months. Then Allah made an exception from fighting the hypocrites uh, in the case of three groups, two of whom were instructed, uh, two of whom he was instructed to leave alone and the instruction was confirmed. The first group was those who joined a people with whom the Muslims had a treaty according to which they would not fight them. Those who joined that group would come under the same ruling as them and thus their lives and property would be protected. So in this instance, we have a protection on disbelievers. The, the second group was people whose hearts felt discomfort at the prospect of fighting either you or their own people. That is, they remain as they were and cannot let themselves fight you or fight their own people. They want to refrain from fighting both groups. Allah commanded the Muslims not to fight these people either. So two groups we were told not to fight. Uh, excuse me, the Muslims were told not to fight at that time. And he explained the wisdom behind that. If Allah had willed, he could have given them resolve and they would have fought you. So there were three possibilities. Either they would be with you and fight your enemies, which was not possible in the case of these people. So there remained only the possibility of fighting you alongside their own people or not fighting uh, either side. Which is the lesser of the two evils as far as you are concerned? For Allah could have given them that resolve to fight against you. So you should accept this blessing and praise your Lord who restrained them from fighting you uh, when they could have done so. Therefore, if these people let you be and do not fight you and offer you peace, then Allah has granted you any reason uh, to fight against them. The third group is the people who care only for their own interests and they have no respect for you. These are the ones of whom Allah says, Others among these hypocrites you will find who want to be safe from you because they are afraid of you and safe from their own people. Uh, but whoever, but whenever they are faced anew with temptation to evil, plunge into it headlong. That is, they are still persisting in their disbelief and hypocrisy. So whenever anything happens to them of turmoil and trouble, it blinds them and causes them to rush headlong into trouble, increasing their disbelief and hypocrisy. These people appear outwardly to be like the second group, but in fact, they are different from them because the second group refrains from fighting the believers out of respect towards them, not out of fear for themselves. But this group refrains from fighting them out of fear, not out of respect. Rather, if they had the opportunity to fight the believers, they would be ready to make the most of it. If they do not show any sign of wanting to refrain from fighting, then they should be fought. 
Hence, Allah says, therefore, if they do not let you be and do not offer you peace and do not restrain their hands from fighting you, then seize them and slay them wherever you encounter them. For Allah has given you a clear reason to fight against them. That is, he has given you clear proof that they are transgressing against you and are not seeking peace. So they have no one to blame but themselves. So I'm going to unpack that just very, very briefly. Basically, what was happening was there was three groups of people. Two of them were not a threat. One of them was indeed a threat. The one that was a threat, there was an instruction to the Prophet to uh, fight back and not give them any type of leniency, period. So obviously, this was for protection. Uh, this was for self-defense, and this was for um, for the preservation of the, the belief system and the deen, right? So uh, there is a clear-cut context, context here to this uh, 89 verse. And, uh, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reward Asadi for giving us uh, that insight. Except for those who take refuge, so I'm going to continue on now. Except for those who take refuge with the people between yourselves and whom is a treaty or those who come to you, their hearts strained at the prospect of fighting you or fighting their own people. And if Allah had willed, he could have given them power over you and they would have fought you. So if they remove themselves from you and do not fight you and offer you peace, then Allah has not made for you a cause for fighting against them. So again, once there's an inclination towards peace uh, with Islam, we're 100% cool and there's no fighting. You will find others who wish to obtain security from you and to obtain security from their people. Every time they are returned to the influence of disbelief, they fall back into it. So if they do not withdraw from you or offer you peace or restrain their hands, then seize them and kill them wherever you overtake them. And those we have made for you against them a clear authorization. So he was given authorization by divine right um, uh, for uh, preservation and all the other things aforementioned. And never is it for a believer to kill a believer except by mistake. Okay. Very next verse. Here it states. Um, and never is it for a believer to kill a believer uh, except by mistake. And whoever kills a believer by mistake, then the freeing of a believing slave and compensation payment uh, presented to his uh, deceased family is required unless they give up their right as charity. So the family has the ability to forgive you if it's a mistake. Uh, but if he, which is the deceased, was from a people at war with you and he was a believer, then only the freeing of a believing slave. And if he was from a people with whom you have a treaty, then a compensation payment presented to his family and the freeing of a believing slave, AKA friendly fire. Okay, so like if an arrow hits somebody, this, uh, this is a form of friendly fire. Um, it probably happened, you know, probably happened and there needed to be a ruling. I mean, it's not even probably, it definitely happened and there needed to be a ruling, okay? And whoever does not find one or cannot afford to buy one, then instead a fast for two months consecutively seeking acceptance of, of repentance from Allah and Allah is ever knowing and wise. Now, okay, look, I... Uh, I have had the blessing to um, not be engaged in type of like any type of like military combat or something like that. But I have many friends that have been to the military that have been to the front lines. And I'll tell you something right now. Uh, every single one of them regret it. Every single one of them regret it. And it's because they know that mankind, humankind was not built for war. It's just something that on a mental thing is you know, it's very difficult to chop up. Now, in the event that um, there was friendly fire, which happens all the time, especially in modern warfare, um, it's it's a it's already a pretty big punishment, meaning that you have to live with that, that something like that happened. OK, um, and I think that the the path to fasting and, and, and all these other things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's it's more of a way for you to um, Obviously, get the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also to forgive yourself because you've you've made good with God. Okay. And obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that changes the hearts, changes the condition of a person. So if if you were to take these steps to uh, if you were to take these steps to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would ease that burden. But whoever kills a believer intentionally, so this is intentionally, his recompense is hellfire, uh, wherein he will abide eternally. 
So again, it's about intent. If you if you're trying to pull some, you know, shady stuff, forget it. Uh, so uh, wherein he will abide eternally, and Allah has become angry with him and has cursed him and has prepared for him a great punishment. Uh, so th that's pretty that's pretty much as severe as it gets. Oh, you who have believed when you go forth to fight in the cause of Allah, investigate, investigate, and do not say to one who gives you a greeting of peace, you are not a believer. Aspiring for the goods of worldly life for what Allah uh, are many acquisitions. You yourselves were like that before when Allah conferred his favor, i.e. guidance upon you. So investigate. That's two times Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says investigate. Indeed, Allah is ever of what you do aware. So war is not a pretty thing, and um, you're making a pretty darn big decision when you're taking somebody else's life, especially if it, it's in the wrong context, such as uh, innocence, right? And you have to conduct thorough investigation. And I know that there is a story of the Prophet where there was one of his companions who was about to strike down a man, and the man said, I am a Muslim, and uh, uh, the companion struck him down anyway. And uh, when the Prophet heard about this, he got extremely angry and he said, uh, did, did you know what was in his chest? You know, I like as in, how were you so certain? So what if he if he was being a hypocrite, you give him the benefit of the, of the doubt. And that further is reinforced by this ayah in the Quran, which is to investigate twice and let it be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so what? I, I mean, if you're stricken down and you chose the uh, if you if you chose the path of being merciful and you are stricken down in that, your reward is in the hereafter. Okay, uh, which is take the road of caution. Okay, not equal are those believers remaining at home other than the disabled, the mujahideen, who strive and fight in the cause of Allah with their wealth and their lives. Allah has preferred the mujahideen through their wealth and their lives over those who remain behind by degrees. And to all, which is uh, both, Allah has promised the best reward but Allah has preferred the mujahideen over those who remain behind with, an, uh, uh, with a great reward. So, I mean, it's it's almost like a compliment sandwich over here, okay? But again, there needs to be conditions for war. There's no such thing as vigilantism in Islam. So you can't just be like, oh, I'm going to go conduct your head, blah, 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 blah. No, it doesn't work that way. You don't have the authority to do that. Uh, degrees of high position from him and forgiveness and mercy, and Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. Indeed, those whom the angels take in death while wrong wronging themselves, the angels will say, in what condition were you? They will say, we were oppressed in the land. They, the angels will say, was not the earth of Allah spacious enough for you to emigrate therein? For those, their refuge is hellfire, uh, and evil is it as a destination." Obviously, this is case specific. Somebody needs to have the ability to migrate, like all this other stuff. Okay, so just use your better judgment and kind of reflect on this stuff as we as we read it together, inshallah. Except for the oppressed among men, women, and children who cannot devise a plan, nor are they directed to a way. Okay, well, there you go. There's your reflection. The very next verse answers you. Okay. For those, it is expected that Allah will pardon them, and Allah is ever pardoning and forgiving. Meaning, if there's no way out, okay, and you're stuck, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive you and pardon you. And whoever uh, emigrates for the cause of Allah will find on the earth many uh, alternative locations and abundance. And whoever leaves his home as an emigrant to Allah and his messenger, and then death overtakes him, his reward has already become incumbent upon Allah. And Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be indebted to you. Okay. Uh, he will be indebted to you uh, once that emigration takes place, which is a pretty cool thing, right? Um, if there's definitely somebody that's going to give you payment, it's going to be uh, the Almighty, right? And when you travel throughout the land, there is no blame upon you for shortening the prayer, especially if you fear what those who disbelieve may disrupt or attack you. Indeed, the disbelievers are ever to you a clear enemy. Okay, so you do have the ability to shorten your a prayer. The load is lightened. Uh, meaning uh, uh, it's for the purposes of safety. And I know that what the companions used to do and the Prophet is they, they would take turns. Um, they would they would uh, pray in, in certain ranks and they would take turns to watch each other's backs. Uh, when you, i.e. the commander of an army, are among them and lead them in prayer, let a group of them stand in prayer with you and let them carry their arms. 
and and when they have prostrated let them uh, be in a position behind you and have the other group come forward which has not yet prayed and let them pray with you taking precaution and carrying their arms those who disbelieve wish that you would neglect your weapons and your baggage so they could come down upon you in one single attack but there is no blame upon you if you are troubled by rain or ill for putting down your arms but take precaution indeed allah has prepared for the disbelievers a humiliating punishment fantastic so uh, again you have lightning conditions especially if you're ill or you're or you are um here if you are troubled by rain so like certain type of elements or conditions or if you're ill you have the ability to put down your arms but allah subhanahu wa says take precaution and again use your better judgment remember islam is a it's a thought-based religion you don't just sit there and do things willy-nilly so use your better judgment okay allah subhanahu wa is constantly encouraging us do you not reflect do you not think um, uh, do you not uh, ponder? Do you not wonder? Take precaution, take heed, look at this, look at that, listen to this. What about this story? What about that? He, he's constantly engaging the human being to think. And when you have completed the prayer, remember Allah standing, sitting, or lying on your sides. But when you become secure, reestablish regular prayer. Indeed, prayer has been decreed upon the believers, a decree of specified times. Uh, another argument against the um, hadith rejectors, the Quran only people, which they're in, in fact Quran rejectors, is we would not know all of these specified times had it not been for the Prophet. Uh, and do not weaken in pursuit of the enemy if you would be suffering. So are they suffering as you are suffering, but you expect from Allah what uh, that which they expect not. And Allah is ever knowing and wise. Indeed, we have revealed to you, O Muhammad, وسلم, the book in truth. So you may judge between the people by that which Allah has shown you and do not be for the deceit uh, for the deceitful and advocate. OK, you can't stand up for injustice. You can't stand up for deceit because uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be the ultimate judge. And he has revealed the book in truth. So judge in truth and see forgiveness of Allah. Indeed, Allah is ever forgiving and merciful and do not argue on behalf of those who deceive themselves. Indeed, Allah loves not one who is habitually a sinful deceiver. They conceal their evil intentions and deeds from the people, but they cannot conceal them from Allah. And he is with them in his knowledge. When they spend the night in such as he does not accept of speech, uh, and ever is a law of what they do encompassing, meaning when they're sitting there talking behind closed doors and having their, their private meetings and, you know, having their own thoughts uh, circulate them at night. This is, uh, you can't hide from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter what, okay? Uh, here you are, those who argue on their behalf in this worldly life, but who will argue with Allah for them on the day of resurrection or who will be then their representative? So imagine this is like a strict warning to the people that are just like shady lawyers and shady judges and, you know, all these like people that are just protecting evil in this world. <laughs> There's not going to be any of that for them in the hereafter. And whoever does a wrong or wrongs himself, but then seeks forgiveness of Allah will find Allah forgiving and merciful. So again, the concept of mercy. And whoever earns or commits a sin only earns it against himself meaning you're not going to be uh, uh, ob obligated for somebody else's uh, sin. Uh, and Allah is ever knowing and wise. So here's a key difference between uh, Islam and Christianity. You know, um, Christianity believes in an original sin that was conducted by Adam and that this sin was passed down. And now, you know, you have these uh, women that are going to, you know, bear the uh, pain of childbirth and wet men are going to sweat in the fields and all this other stuff. In Islam, it, it doesn't work that way. You're not responsible for any actions other than your own. You don't have uh, things like your father or cousin or somebody like that. You can't do any type of substitution or anything like that. And alhamdulillah for that. Um, but whoever earns an uh, okay. Uh, but whoever earns an offense or a sin and then blames it on an innocent person has taken upon himself a slander and manifests sin. So this is very interesting. Meaning, meaning that if you were to, or again, this is my understanding of it, if you were to um, commit a heinous act, okay, and somebody's innocence was taken away by you committing that act, meaning you had inspired them to commit the act now, um, 
then you have now taken upon the manifestation of that sin. So we have, uh, you know, stories of the past of, I think it was Qabil who was the first murderer. Okay. And now because he inspired that act, there is a portion of murder that is attributed to him now. Okay. Meaning he was the first one to commit something like that. And he, he manifested that. Now, anybody who commits murder, there's a portion that's going to be attributed to him. Not, not the individual's actions. And this is the, the key difference. Not the individual's actions. Rather, it's the manifestation of thereof. Okay. So um, what we can do is we can visit the tafsir really quickly. And we can see if we can gain some uh, additional insight from that. So let's see, this is uh, ayah number 112, and we'll see if, uh, we'll see if a Sadi is able to give us some additional insight. Let's see here. Oh, I'm at 116. Okay, here we go. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Okay, so it's a it's a long uh, segment. So he's he's commenting between 105 to 113. So bear with me really quickly um, while I just quickly locate the um, while I quickly locate the portion that is relevant to. Uh, so what's relevant to us? So I think here it is. Then Allah says, yet whoever does evil or wrongs his own soul, but thereafter asks Allah for forgiveness, will find Allah off forgiving and most merciful. Okay, so that's 110. Next. And whoever earns sin earns it only against his own soul. No bearer of burdens can bear the burdens of another, but if evil deeds become prevalent and no one objects to them, then the punishment will become widespread and the burden of sin will encompass everyone. That does not contradict the ruling of this verse because the one who fails to object to and denounce sin as is required to do so has earned the sin. This highlights the justice and wisdom of Allah, for he does not punish anyone for the sin of another, nor does he uh, mete out a punishment any greater than which is befitted to the sin. Hence, he says, Allah is all-knowing, most wise. That is, he is in perfect knowledge and perfect wisdom. Uh, by his knowledge and wisdom, he knows about the sin and that re and what results from it. Um, okay, here we are. But whoever commits an offense, that is, commits a major sin or a sin that is a lesser sin, then blames it on an innocent person, that is, he accuses someone else of this sin that he committed who is innocent of that, even though he may have committed other sins, will bear the guilt of slander and manifest sin. That is, he has taken upon himself the burden of accusing an innocent person and of manifest sin. So two things, accusing an innocent person and the manifest sin. This indicates that uh, this is false accusation is a major sin that incurs punishment. That is because he has combined a number of evils. He has incurred a burden of sin. Then he accused one who did not uh, do it uh, uh, do it of doing, excuse me. Then he accused one who did not do it of doing it. Really interesting kind of uh, phraseology right there, but basically you're accusing someone of something they didn't do. Then he uttered a foul lie by declaring himself innocent and accusing an innocent person. Then that led to punishment in this world, which was warded off from the one who deserved it and was carried out on the one who did not deserve it. It also led to people talking about one who was innocent, and there are other evil consequences. We ask Allah to keep us safe uh, from them and from all evils. Okay, so the position that um, so the position that he's taking is because that person got away with it in this world, uh, now it has to come back full swing. Okay, all right. So um, carrying on, uh, uh, Bismillah. And if it was not for the favor of Allah upon you, O Muhammad, and his mercy, uh, وسلم, and his mercy, a group of them would have determined to mislead you, but they do not mislead except themselves, and they will not harm you at all. And Allah has revealed to you the book and wisdom and has taught you that which you did not know. Uh, and ever has the favor of Allah upon you been great. 
And I think we're coming uh, very close to the end of the juice here, guys. Yeah, we are indeed very close, just a few pages. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reward you guys for your patience and time well spent, inshallah. Uh, no good is there in much of their private conversations, except for those who enjoin charity or that uh, which is right or conciliation between people. And whoever does that seeks me, uh, seeking means to the approval of Allah, then we are going to give him a great reward. And whoever opposes the messenger after guidance has become clear to him and follows other than the way of the believers, we will give him what he has taken and drive him into hellfire and evil is the des and evil it is as a destination. So again, for the people that have not um, heard the message, the, proper message of Islam, not just some pish posh version, but the proper message of Islam, they'll be given a different test on the day of judgment. Indeed, Allah does not forgive association with him, but he forgives what is less than that for whom he wills. And he who associates other with Allah has certainly gone far astray, meaning it's not something that you just did overnight. You've gone way far. Uh, they call upon instead of him none but female deities and they actually call upon none but a rebellious satan whom allah has cursed for he had said i will surely take from among your servants a specific portion and i will mislead them and i will arouse them in sinful desires and i will command them so they will slit the ears of cattle and i will be command and i will command them so they will change the creation of allah and whoever takes satan as an ally instead of allah has certainly sustained a clear loss now I just want to take just a quick second here because this is very profound, especially with what's going on today with the whole uh, LGBTQ transgender movement, stuff like that. He says, I will command them uh, to change the creation of Allah. Okay. Now this goes, this goes to the extremes of stuff like that. All right. Um, where now there's no differentiation between male, female, and it's just about, you know, uh, blurring the lines between absolutely everything and it gets down to the nuancing of genetic engineering of food okay so subhanallah if you really just reflect on just this alone this is enough evidence uh from the this is a, a proof that the quran is from the almighty because nobody 1400 years ago would have been speaking like this period and obviously uh, this is not the prophet's words this is the words of, of the creator he, Satan, promises them and arouses desire in them. So these are desires of people wanting to change them, themselves for the worse. Uh, but Satan does not promise them except delusion. So he's telling them, oh, go ahead, do, do what you got to do, change yourself. You'll feel so much better about yourself, but it's a delusionary thing. Suicide rates are up like crazy. People are getting bullied. They're getting all the repercussions of, of the hormonal changes and stuff like that. I mean, people are losing their minds. Um, what they see in the mirror is not, it, you know, it, the, it's a shattered form of reality now. The refuge of those will be hell, and they will not find from it an escape. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and help those that are going through that trial. Uh, but the ones who believe and do righteous deeds, we will admit them to gardens beneath which rivers flow, wherein they will abide forever. So again, punishment, and now coming back to the concept of reward. It is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is true. And who is more truthful than Allah in statement? Obviously. Why would God lie? Uh, God doesn't need to tell a lie. He just says be and it is. And he alters the entire fabric of reality. God, <laughs> God can't lie. Okay. It is paradise. Uh, it, it, it i.e. paradise, is not obtained by your wishful thinking, nor by that of the people of the scripture. Whoever does a wrong will be recompensed for it. And he will not find besides Allah a protector or a helper. And whoever does righteous deeds, whether male or female, while being a believer, those will enter paradise and will not be wronged, even as much as the speck on a date seed. So, again, you're not going to be wrong in the slightest. We believe in a just creator. Uh, and alhamdulillah for that. And who is better in religion than one who submits himself to Allah while being a doer of good and following the religion of Abraham inclining towards the truth? I mean, think about that for a second. Who is who is honestly going to be better, right? Somebody that's upon falsehood, somebody that's selling you, you know, a, a bunch of BS in the world. Forget about it. And Allah took Abraham as an intimate friend. You know, subhanAllah, to be this honored in the Quran is uh, that's what dreams are made of. 
and to Allah belong whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth and ever is a law of all things encompassing. And they request from you, O Muhammad وسلم, a legal ruling concerning women. Say Allah gives you a ruling about them and about what uh, has been recited to you in the book concerning the orphan girls to whom you do not give what is decreed for them. And yet you desire to marry them and concerning the oppressed among children. Uh, and that you maintain for orphans their rights in justice. And whatever you do of good, indeed, Allah is ever knowing of it. it we have rules on how we treat uh, orphans. We have rules on um, how they're honored and protected. All these things are, are these are, these are a strictly protected class in Islam. And if a woman fears from her husband contempt or invasion, uh, excuse me, if a woman fears from her husband content or evasion, there is no sin upon them if they make terms of settlement between them and settlement is best. And a person, uh, and a person, uh, excuse me, and present in human souls is greed. But if you do good and fear Allah, then a, indeed Allah is ever of what you do aware. So look, divorce is, is completely legal in Islam. Okay. It wasn't legal previously with, with the, with like, uh, when I mean when I say previously, I'm talking about like the Christianity and the Judaism stuff like that. There's no such thing as divorce. Okay. Um, uh, but it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us of greed here, meaning that if you're going to divorce from somebody, part ways justly. All right. Remember, we have to do everything within the concept of justice. Uh, and you will never be able to be equal in feeling between wives, even if you should strive to do so. So do not incline completely towards one and leave another hanging. And if you amend your affairs and fear Allah, then indeed Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. And this also ties back to the marriage of multiple wives because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us straight up, you will never be able to be equal in feeling between wives. So, you know, marry one. <laughs> it's the safer route, okay? Uh, but if they se separate by divorce, Allah will enrich each of them from his abundance and ever is Allah encompassing the wise. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, the owner of all bounty. So if, you know, you're not going to be arguing over anything else other than Allah's bounty. So don't argue over it at all. And to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. And we have instructed those who were given the scripture before you and yourselves to fear Allah. But if you disbelieve, then to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. And ever is Allah free uh, of need and praiseworthy. And to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. And sufficient is Allah as disposer of affairs. If he wills, he can do away with you, O people, and bring others in your place. And ever is Allah competent to do that. Uh, the table doesn't ask the master, why did you create me? What are you going to do with me? What do you want from me? Uh, why do you want that from me? Blah, 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 blah. Okay. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to get rid of his creation, so be it. There's nothing you can do. You're created. There's nothing you can do. Whoever desires the reward of this world, then Allah, uh, then with Allah is the reward of this world and the hereafter. And ever is Allah hearing and seeing. O oh, you who have believed, O oh, you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah. Uh, and even if it be against yourselves or your parents and relatives, okay? So here's the deal. In Islam, you have to stand up for justice to the point where even if it's going up against your own family, if you're committing injustice by siding with your family, you're committing, uh, you are committing a grave sin against the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what more beautiful thing could that be, right, than to stand in justice even if it's against your own family? Whether one is rich or poor, Allah is more worthy of both. So follow not personal inclination lest you not be just. And if you distort your testimony or refuse to give it, then indeed is uh, indeed Allah is ever of what you do aware. You know, subhanAllah. Uh, what more beautiful thing can, can be said about uh, justice? O oh, you who have believed, uh, believe in Allah and his messenger and the book that he sent down upon his messenger and the scripture which he sent down before. And whoever disbelieves in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, and the last day has certainly gone far astray. Indeed, those who have believed, then disbelieved, then believed, then disbelieved, and then increased in disbelief, will never, uh, never will Allah forgive them, nor will he guide them to a way. So this is talking about people that have entered Islam, okay, entered a state of submission, 
seen the truth, fallen out for whatever reason, okay, and then uh, entered it back again. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by his mercy, brought them back. He brought them back. And now they chose their own desires again. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here is that the pattern is not going to stop. If, if you're constantly bouncing back and forth and choosing your own desires and you're following emotion, you're in deep trouble, right? Um, so never will Allah forgive them, nor will he guide them to a way, okay? So you're, he's just going to keep you upon disbelief. Give tidings to the hypocrites that there is for them a painful punishment. So yeah, hey, here's a gift for you. Here's a lump of coal, right? In a, in a fancy, fancy packaged uh, box. Those who take disbelief as allies instead of the believers, excuse me, those who take disbelievers as allies instead of the believers, do they seek with them honor through power? But indeed, honor belongs to Allah entirely. It's up to Almighty God who he bestows that honor upon, whether that be, uh, you know, a king or uh, someone who is a homeless person. Uh, in Islam, you can have people that lead the prayer that are street cleaners because they're so honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of their knowledge of the Quran and their masterful and beautiful recitations. Okay. Uh, those, uh, excuse me. And it is, it has already come down to you in the book, which is the Quran, that when you hear the verses of Allah recited, they are denied by them and ridiculed. So do not sit with them until they enter into another conversation. Indeed, you would then be like them. Indeed, Allah will gather the hypocrites and the disbelievers in hellfire altogether. And this is coming uh, to the last page of the juz. Alhamdulillah, we are almost there, guys. Those who wait, those who wait and watch you, uh, those who wait and watch you, then if uh, you gain a victory from Allah, they say, were we not with you? But if the disbelievers have a success, they say to them, did we not gain the advantage over you, but we protected you from the believers? Allah will judge between all of you on the day of resurrection, and never will Allah give disbelievers over the believers a way to overcome them. Okay, so they might get temporary victories, but the lasting victory is not, it, it, they're never going to overcome. Indeed, the hypocrites think to deceive Allah, but he is deceiving them. And remember, this is, an, this is a consequential form of deception, meaning that he is opening up doors for them. So it's because of their disbelief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is punishing them with deception. It's not that Allah is now all of a sudden a deceiver, which is the stupidest arguments that you'll hear uh, from people that are Islamophobic. Rather, he's talking about people that are hypocritical which means they're already upon disbelief. And because of their hypocrisy, because of their deception, Allah punish, punishes them with exactly what they deserved, which is deception. Huh? Okay. And when they stand for prayer, they stand lazily, showing themselves to the people and not remembering Allah except a little. Okay? Wavering between them, belonging neither to these, which is the believers, nor to those, which is the disbelievers. And whoever Allah sends astray, never will you find for him a way. O you who have believed, do not take the disbelievers as allies instead of the believers. And again, allyship, or this is a very strong word. This is talking about people in close relationships that you trust with guarded secrets and so on. Do you wish to give Allah against yourselves a clear case? Okay. So what he's saying is, uh, again, that old saying, if you hang around a barbershop, you're going to get a haircut. So you're going to have a clear cut case against you if you are spilling the secrets and getting that haircut. right? And then all of a sudden you wonder, oh, why, why am I having so much trouble praying? Why am I having so much trouble with belief? Why am I so because you took people like that as your allies. That's why. Simple. Okay. Indeed, the hypocrites will be in the lowest depths of the fire and never will you find for them a helper except for those who repent, correct themselves, hold, hold fast to Allah, and are sincere in their religion for Allah. For those will be with the believers, and Allah is going to give the believers a great reward. So again, even after all of those warnings, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is opening up a door of mercy and saying, you know what, you still have the opportunity to correct yourself, still. And he's still going to help you. What would Allah do with i.e. gain from your punishment if you are grateful and believe, okay? So 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want to punish people. He's not benefiting or gaining or diminishing in any which way. Why wouldn't he want the best for you? And ever is Allah appreciative and knowing. I mean, you know, subhanAllah, just reading just this verse alone, just this verse alone, these two verses alone is enough to become a Muslim. You, you have mercy upon mercy upon a, a clear-cut conversation and just a truth said to you, look, I've got nothing to gain from your punishment. Nothing. So do yourself a favor and get all the rewards. All right. Alhamdulillah, uh, we have finished the fifth juz. Um, thank you so much for your patience while I was reading that. And uh, barakallahu okay. feek. Uh, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad wa ala ali wa ashabina Muhammad kama sallaita ala Ibrahim wa ala ali wa ashabi Ibrahim fil alameen innaka hamidun majid Allahumma barak ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad wa ala ali wa ashabi Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali wa ashabi Ibrahim fil alameen innaka hamidun majid I also want to say that any mistakes or errors uh, is purely from uh, me and the Prophet as well as uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are free from error in any which way. So uh, please forgive me if I said anything hurtful or wrong. And I wish you guys all the best of the remainder of the night. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to elevate you. And inshallah, I will see you guys tomorrow for the next just. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.